Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Bianna Magbitang, and I am the Regional Director for Climate Tracker. Um, we help journalists and communicators like you spread awareness and critical climate issues. And today we will be discussing the LNG expansion in Southeast Asia and how our fellows, Gaya Chang and Napaten Hretate, were able to cover the issue with the help of our partner, um, Seed. So um, we will I'll just give you an overview of what will happen. We will first present a quick overview of Seed's LNG study um, study on LNG expansion in Southeast Asia. Then we'll move forward to discuss our fellowship journey. We will be able to um, have some time for a Q&A discussion at the end of um, a short panel. But um, so if you have any questions for any of our speakers, please type them on the chat window and we'll try to address them during the Q&A. Um, by the end of our day, um, we are really hoping that you will feel more comfortable and confident about reporting and writing on LNG expansion in the ASEAN region. We're very passionate about increasing the number of climate stories um, in, around the world, especially in the global south. So um, I hope you will really learn a thing or two as we discuss discoveries and learnings today. Um, so without further ado, we'll start with Attorney Avril de Torres, the Deputy Executive Director of SEED, who will be speaking on their LNG study. Take it away, Av. Thank you, Vienna, and good day to everyone. First of all, I wanna thank Climate Tracker for inviting SEED to this exciting community hangout with journalists who are covering stories of LNG expansion across Asia. We are honored to get this conversation going by sharing some key findings of a report that we published last month. It's entitled The Financing of Fossil Future, Tracing the Money Pipeline of Fossil Gas in Southeast Asia. So, this report examines the state of fossil gas projects and investments in Southeast Asia in the years after the Paris Agreement was adopted in 2015 and at the start of this critical decade for climate action. It identifies the top developers that are promoting the gas industry through various projects across the fossil gas and LNG value chain and the financial institutions that are bankrolling these projects, whether through loans, underwriting services and investments. So the financial transactions covered in this report were intended for project finance. And for those that were intended for general corporate purposes, we limited it to those transactions involving developers whose businesses are limited to fossil gas related operations. Um, and as you can see here, we are glad to have several other civil society organizations in Southeast Asia and across the globe that are working on energy finance um, endorsing this report. We started the report by painting this unfortunate picture of Southeast Asia's challenge of confronting a fossil future to locate the, the significance of tracking who are the developers and financiers of this industry. What was coal's last bastion just a few years ago is now swiftly turning into Asia's fossil gas and LNG hub. Governments, power companies are promoting massive gas expansion plants under the guise of development. So right now, the region is confronted with 138 gigawatt of new gas-fired power plants and 118 LNG terminals being proposed or are already being constructed in the region today. This is a major challenge for climate vulnerable Asian peoples, given the very small window that we collectively have in avoiding runaway climate change in this decade. So in this report, you'll find spreads of the companies driving fossil gas projects um, during the post Paris period, that's from 2016 up to the first quarter of 2022. We also ranked the top developers of projects in development, which means um, those that are proposed or already under construction. You'll also find in chapter four, the top financiers 
or those fueling these fossil gas and LNG projects in the region, both post Paris and for those that are under development currently. So I just wanted to show these spreads so that you can quickly check the report if you want to know who are the top developers and financiers um, in the region. But for the sake of time, uh, let me jump to the main findings of the report. First, Vietnam and the Philippines are building the biggest gas-fired power capacities in the region in terms of capacity. If all planned gas expansion of um, 138 gigawatt uh, capacity in development is built, Southeast Asia's gas-fired operating capacity will more than double. Vietnam leads the region's planned gas expansion with 56.3 gigawatts in pre-construction and construction status or in, in the development stage. The Philippines follows behind with 29.9 gigawatts in development. So SMC Global Power, the Philippine conglomerate is leading this expansion with 14.1 gigawatts of proposed projects. And this already accounts for half of the planned gas expansion in the Philippines. But if we look at this in terms of projects um, built since Paris, Indonesia and Thailand top the list. Uh, first is Indonesian state-owned PP Perusahan District Megara or PLN, followed by EGAT or the Electricity Generating Authority of Thailand, which um, owns two in five power plants that have been built and proposed in Thailand in the last uh, six years. As for midstream projects, we are observing aggressive LNG importation build out among otherwise LNG um, exporting countries like Indonesia and Malaysia, which are now experiencing depleting supply. But it's still Thailand that is leading in terms of new import um, LNG capacity. Um, this is led by Thai state owned oil and gas company PPT, which is building one in 10 LNG import facility projects in Southeast Asia since uh, the Paris Agreement. For LNG export, build out is concentrated in only three countries. That's Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and Malaysia. These are countries that represent, unfortunately, 30% uh, of the world's coral reefs within the Coral Triangle, and now they are um, facing this aggressive build out of LNG export terminals. Um, these projects have overseas investors involved except for the two export facilities owned by Malaysia's state-owned Petronas. Shell and Japan's Intex also own the largest proposed LNG export facility, which is the Abadi LNG terminal. The um, American multinational company ExxonMobil and Papua New Guinea's largest exploration company, Oil Search Limited, uh, also have interest in three proposed projects in Papua New Guinea. And then uh, when it comes to pipelines, Cambodia and Indonesia make up 65% of new gas pipelines in the entire region. Cambodia has a combined length of more than 2,500 kilometers followed by Indonesia and then Thailand. Um, PTT, which is a proponent of all of Thailand's new gas pipelines um, emerges as the top developer in the region. It's followed by Petro Vietnam and Pertamina, which are each seeking to build over 400 kilometers of gas pipelines in Vietnam and, and Indonesia, respectively. Now, when it comes to financing, um, the report found that since the signing of the Paris Agreement six years ago, 123 financial institutions have channeled 33.4 billion US, do US dollars into the fossil gas industry in Southeast Asia. Uh, ranking the highest were Sumitomo Mitsui Financial, Mizuho, DBS, and also Oversea Chinese Banking and Mitsubishi UFJ Financial. Um, each of these banks uh, have at least 7 billion US dollars worth of loans and credit gar guarantee and participation. But as for top underwriters, these were mostly dominated by local banks like Malaysia's Mal Malayan Banking, 
uh, Thailand's Bank of Ayudhya, Siam Commercial, Cassicorn Bank, and CIMB Bank. What is concerning about these uh, financiers are the fact that many have made climate pledges. 30 of the 123 financiers of these fossil gas projects in the region are actually signatories of either the Net Zero Banking Alliance, the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, or Net Zero Asset Managers Initiatives. And these are alliances and, and initiatives that form part of the larger GFANS. Um, 15 of the 30 signatories supported 1.4 billion US dollars in fossil gas financing after signing net zero commitments. And 12 out of the 15 are Western institutions. <clears throat> Post Paris, the top five fossil gas financiers consist of banks from countries that are dependent on fossil gas for electricity. So that's Japan and Singapore. Uh, we also found in the report that governments prop up the gas industry through state-owned banks, bilateral development banks, and export credit agencies. And then lastly on financiers, um, at the start of the new decade, five banks became top financiers for the gas industry with transactions comprising largely of bond issuances. So um, in, in total, we found that bond issuances uh, that funded gas projects almost equaled that of loans and credits. And this made glaring that it is now more imperative to close loopholes and fossil fuel pledges that cover only direct loans or credits to fossil gas projects. So before we move on to recommendations, uh, I think it's also worth noting that in chapters five and six of the report, we discussed case studies of highly contested and reputational risk projects uh, in the Philippines and in Thailand. And I think for those who are interested in, in, in covering these stories, it would be um, good for you to also look into those chapters of the report. So to end, we have three broad recommendations um, after finding who are the top developers in financial institutions, um, driving and fueling uh, a fossil future in the region. First is adopt a Paris aligned policy that pursues a 1.5 degree Celsius pathway, knowing that every degree matters. We specifically recommend the P1 scenario of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Changes special report on global warming of 1.5 with no false solutions. Um, we've detailed uh, here what we think that means from full prohibition um, to setting disclosures and, and measurable targets. We also made um, a distinction uh, regarding the critical roles of regional development banks and local banks in adopting a Paris aligned um, policy. So here you can see um, regional development banks with mandates on encouraging economic development, providing both financial support and technical assistance for developing countries. We think that these banks should be leading the adoption of the most ambitious Paris aligned energy policies and strategies to finance the necessary energy transformation in Southeast Asia. The most ambitious policy for us means that there should be no financing for new fossil gas projects and for all companies engaged in fossil gas expansion projects. As for local banks, they should align financial flows to rapid uh, and just transition pathways that are in accordance with their own country's fair share in the 1.5 degree Celsius Paris goal. Um, and this should prohibit financing for new oil and gas fields. And then for our last two recommendations, we mentioned how there, these banks should withdraw and prohibit financing for fossil gas projects that violate human rights, endanger critically important and biologically diverse ecosystems and habitats, and pose grave reputational risks. Um, 
Finally, there should also be disclosure of all financial services that are provided to this industry, and the bank should adopt the full recommendations of the Task Force on Climate-Related Disclosures to support, this, to support its shareholders and its stakeholders in appropriately assessing and pricing these climate-related risks and to ensure that the overall effects of climate change become routinely considered in the business and investment decisions. So this is where I'll end. We hope that this study will provide energy transition advocates, academics, NGOs, communities, um, and, and movements, uh, a region of wealth, um, in, in the region, um, a wealth of, of data and analysis on who to engage um, and put pressure on as we confront this challenge of a fossil future. Um, and we are very grateful to all of the journalists covering the stories of fossil gas and LNG expansion across the region. We hope that um, um, we'll hear more of these stories and we'll have more of these stories covered. Um, if you want to read more, you can visit our website, seedphilippines.com and download the report. Thank you so much. Thanks, Av. Uh, thank you for that presentation. And as I said a while ago, we will be opening the floor for a question. So if you want to ask Avril about um, their study, please stick around for a while as we talk about um, our fellowship journey with um, SEEDS. So I wanted to introduce to you our fellows from Vietnam, the Philippines, and Thailand, Chang, Gaya, and um, Napat, to tell us a bit about the story they wrote. So Chang, let's start with you. Oh, hello everyone. I'm Chang, a journalist based in Vietnam and I'm commuting on a shuttle bus right now. So sorry for the noise and I might have lost my connection somewhere. So I have to apologize first. So for this fellowship, I had uh, to conduct many interviews with uh, corporations, central government, many experts, um, villagers and citizens. And um, oh, I mean, during the uh, uh, research, uh, I, I didn't have a chance to go to Barrio Vuntao province, where we uh, will have the first LNG terminal, uh, uh, which will go into op operation uh, this year. Uh, but I went to uh, Haiphong City, where they announced um, uh, the, that they will have three LNG projects running in the future. Um, so uh, the first article, uh, which is an individual uh, article for my part, discusses why Vietnam LNG transition is unlikely to boom in this de decade compared to uh, like other renewable energies like solar and wind energy. Thanks, Chang. How about you, Napat? All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Napat. I'm a journalist and filmmaker based in Bangkok, Thailand. So, yeah, uh, let's start with my, as I am a photojournalist, so I took a photo for this project as well. So yeah, the photo that you are looking, well, so let's jump into the area where I started my article. This is Chenna district, Songkha province, the south of Thailand. And this is the area that has over 100,000 residents and they mostly conduct agriculture and local fisheries. However, like this area is imperial because since 2019, the Royal Thai government has introduced Jana Industrial Modern City of the Future, which will convert over 26 million square meters of coastal land to the industrial estate. This will probably impact the local coastal community and also the, their way of life. For example, Dulam, the traditional fishing technique that use the, because uh, they're gonna use like their ears to locate the fish uh, south to, to do like a fisheries. And this thing is going to be disappeared like, uh, if the project is successfully constructed in this area. So without a proper public hearing by the government, this creates tensions between them and also pushes the local residents outside of the development equation. So yeah, that is the story that I wrote in my individual article. Yeah. Um, so definitely we'll hear more about their articles, but how about you, Gaya? Tell us about your individual story. Um, hello everyone, I'm Gaya Kabiko. I am a climate and environment journalist based here in the Philippines. So for this fellowship, I wrote two stories about the LNG expansion 
in the Philippines. So the first article discussed the LNG landscape here um, in our country. Um, it's some sort of follow the money. And it also tackled the move of the Philippine government to scale up the development of LNG-related infra in anticipation of the depletion of the Malampaya Deep Water to Gas Project in Palawan. And then the second story focused on the threats posed by the LNG expansion in the port city of Batangas to the marine life rich for the island passage and the communities that rely on its resources for a living. So where the island passage or VIP for short is home to 60% of all known shore fish species in the world. And it is also the site of eight planned gas power plants and seven LNG terminals. Um, currently there are five um, existing gas plants in, in Batangas. So um, on the commemoration of Earth Day, I went to Batangas City and covered the protest of local stakeholders who opposed the LNG buildup there. Thank you. Yeah, so those are their stories. So I'm very um, hopeful that everyone can read those stories and because they're really interesting. But I also wanted to ask our fellows um, what have you all discovered through your field work and investigations? Because like you only gave us like broad strokes of what your story is about. Let's start with Napat, then Trang and Gaya. Uh, sure. Uh, what I discover, I think like uh, if you look to map, we have over eighty-two percent of the local additional fishers in Thai water but they have long been marginalized. They are the, uh, plot, actually they are the plot line of the environment who first see the change, such as depletion of fish stock, changing climate and so on. So instead of supporting them, it seems like the threats that they face keep increasing and increasing. So let's say what I discovered is like, if we want to look at the environmental injustice, so I think this is the case that we can look after. Um, yeah, through, through my investigation, I discovered that all, although LNG is considered one of the main solutions to reach Vietnam's COP26 commitment, but our understanding of LNG is very limited. Um, I mean, through my interviews with the corporation, which is PV Gas, um, and also the authority, which is in um, uh, Electricity and Renewable Energy Authority and, uh, from Ministry of uh, Trade. Um, I mean, we also like of studies, researches, and policies to run LNG market in a sustainable way. Yeah. So here in the Philippines, um, the developers of gas projects are the same companies that ventured into gold, um, coal and also um, in the story we discovered who's funding them. And then, so the conglomerate San Miguel Corporation, which is a leader in coal expansion here, is now the biggest developer of fossil gas power in the region. So another discovery is the narrative of the government on the need for a massive LNG development. So according to the Department of Energy, uh, the aggressive development of both renewables and natural gas, they call them, but um, some people want to call it fossil gas, um, is required to meet the country's goal of ensuring um, energy security and transitioning into the utilization of sustainable energy sources. So gas has been pitched um, as a bridge fuel that can support decarbonization efforts. However, um, climate and energy campaigners stress that aggressive LNG expansion will not actually facilitate the transition to cleaner energy resources, but will block it. As Seed mentioned, it is um, a detour um, to the road to renewable energy. And I think it's also the same for Indonesia. We actually have another fellow, our topic who can't who cannot join us unfortunately because she has prior commitments but her story also kind of like touched on the narratives of the government and their response to the LNG buildup in her story she actually highlighted 
how the abundance of natural resources for Indonesia is both a blessing and a curse in a way that the country's fossil gas reserves actually ranks 14th in the world, but due to poor management, there are really major environment impacts. And like just like how in the Philippines, they're actually keen on pursuing fossil gas. And having said all this, what do you think this, this means for your country's energy transition? Chang? Um, well, well, the de development of LNG thermal power projects, well, including LNG terminals and factories, well, on the one hand had uh, the positive effects uh, such as contributing to energy security, uh, creating jobs for uh, local peoples and contributing to increase the income and GDP. But of course, on the other hand, it also has uh, like a potential impact on the marine environment and the coastal communities in the long run. Um, so um, coastal projects can cause major changes to the onshore and coastal ecosystem, including the sea grasses, coral uh, fish uh, due to waste water, solid waste, uh, air pollution and so on. Uh, but the problem in Vietnam is that we doesn't know about the impact. We don't have any studies or the uh, environmental impact assessment um, in the long run. So is uh, this problem is not highlighted in the media. And I think it's the same for Thailand, right, Napat? Like, what do you think in this, you know, um, lack of resources and research could impact um, and mainstreaming can impact your country. So let's say, uh, let's say with the uh, of mainstream media that cover this story, because even though like uh, this already happened in another part of Thailand, but like they still not covered this story yet. So let's talk about like uh, talk about the uh, the example that's already happened in Thailand about the LNG expansion in, and industrial expansion. Uh, let's say it doesn't only happen in the South Thailand. In the article, I also mentioned the area that has been destroyed in the east of Thailand, which is Leong Province, where it's home to a large industrial park focuses on the petrochemical industry uh, and, and LNG expansion which already uh, reaches the area capacity. So, so it's like uh, they cannot like add more LNG to this area. And according to the uh, Global Outlaws of Environmental Justice, which also knows that the local concern over health and environmental impacts of factories, petrochemicals, plants, and oil refineries in the area, it has to maintain the... So, so According to an interview, they said like uh, it has to maintain their livelihood there and like it's still like undercover and still being untold. And I think one of the glaring issues is that um, governments are not really like focusing on this. Instead, they are kind of like picturing and positioning LNG as a transition fuel, like right, Gaya? Yeah, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, he said that it is actually a detour. It is the wall that blocks the countries, um, not only the Philippines' transition to cleaner energy sources, but those that um, deploy this kind of technologies. Um, yeah, I agree. Aside from also exacerbating the existing pressures in marine frontiers, um, increasing the development of LNG-related infra is seen to perpetuate the dependence of Philippines and also other countries on dirtier, more expensive fossil fuels instead of actually deploying um, um, the country's renewable energy potential, which has largely remained untapped. So another problem with LNG is that it is primarily composed of methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas. Um, going back to the um, deployment of renewable ener energy in the Philippines. So the coal moratorium that was issued, coal moratorium on new coal-fired power plants that was issued in 2020 give, gave the Philippines an opportunity to deploy more RV um, technologies. However, currently only 21% of the country's generated power sources um, comes from uh, renewable energy sources. So since LNG 
prices are also expected to remain high and volatile for a few years, this fossil gas expansion could also exacerbate, not alleviate um, the energy security risk and high electricity costs that we are currently experiencing right now in the Philippines. Very well put. I guess um, we can now move forward with your um, discoveries and maybe talk to our journalist friends here on how you were able to kind of like write these stories because of course this will not this is actually not a work walk in the park. We experienced some challenges and um, we kind of like tried to overcome some of it. Uh, Gaya, maybe you can share some of the things that, you know, stop you from progressing in writing your stories. Yeah, um, so for me, it's really the lack of response from companies that are venturing into LNG. So having their input is important to provide a better understanding of why they are pursuing gas and what they're planning to do to mitigate the impacts of their gas plans, not only to the environment, but also to host communities. Um, however, it's a good thing that um, environmental impact assessments of their projects are available online. So I was able to utilize those. Uh, I think we really have to deal with the cards we're dealt with. And I think one of all the problems, if I can just share one of the problems is really um, looking into more data and looking into more um, and finding people who we can interview to give more context on our stories. Um, maybe you can share um, some of our journey in the past. Yeah, that's right, for sure. Like when I have to do like article for sure I would love to make a two side story to balance between like two sides and give their voice equally but like in this case it's pretty hard like honestly because like when I research the study such as environmental impact assessments or EIA I verify the information that says how the Jana project will impact or the LNG expansion will impact the marine biodiversity and the local livelihood, for example, like the EIA covers an area like five kilometers from the industrial estate, but might not be accurate. Like, you know, sediments dug up by dredging the seafloor could be carried by the current and affect coral reefs in the area, in this area. If that happened, the area will lose the biodiversity, which could affect the envi environment in a natural domino effect. So it's like, I'm trying to find like the uh, the balance of this story, but it's pretty hard to find the, uh, the information from the loyal Thai government. So that is the challenge that I face. Uh, like lack of scientific research and data impacts. We also face that in um, our article for Indonesia because not many oceanographers conducted research on the long-term risk of fossil fuel to coastal ecosystems. But aside from lack of resources, I guess it's also good to highlight that we have to consider the media landscape in each country, like how, and especially in Vietnam. So can you tell us how you were able to report and how, how everything um, happened for you, Zhang? I think I had a lot of, um, I'm sorry for the darkness. Uh, I, I had a lot of challenges to go this fellowship because like LNG is like very Vietnam and I experts and now like uh, company with representatives or even representatives from uh, authority and um, um, and and also in Vietnam like in the media landscape in Vietnam it takes a long time to uh, for the, the government and the uh, state-owned company uh, to uh, respond to the uh, information request from process. And not to mention like the National Power Development Plan 8 is, uh, is under the revision of uh, our prime minister right now. So it's like no one is going to talk about it because we don't know for sure, like what is the proportion of um, LNG in the, the overall nation, national energy sources. Um, and also it's, uh, so it's hard to comment about it. 
and also um and another point is that we have like very few environmental journalists who care about um these issues especially i think no one is going to draw a relationship between uh, lng expansion and um its impact on marine biodiversity and coastal community yeah and having said that we actually that's why we had a problem on connecting this to marine ecosystem because we embarked on writing um a collaborative project a collaborative um, article on in summarizing the impact of the lng projects to uh of the region to marine biodiversity in southeast asia so um maybe you can explain further Gaya. yeah sure um, so we chose the impacts of gas plants on the marine life rich waters of Southeast Asia as the cen central theme of our collaborative article because Southeast Asia is largely a maritime sub region in Asia and the LNG power plants and of course terminals are built on coast. Um, in where the island passage in the Philippines, in Thailand's China district, in Indonesia's Bali. Um, so Southeast Asia is also nestling in the Coral Triangle, um, which is a reef network that spans Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, um, and other islands in the Pacific, um, also East Timor. So Coral Triangle is known for its outstanding marine biodiversity. So we really wanted to explore how the gas plants in Southeast Asia will affect um, the coastal and marine uh, ecosystems in our home countries, how it will worsen the current state of its water, waters, and how it will affect the livelihood of fisher folk and million others who depend on these waters. As much as we don't want to this to be kind of like a rant session, but we want to kind of like explain to the journalists here um, how we were able to really flesh out this story. So um, we tried to talk to marine biologists and also scientists and maybe Napat and Trang can share some of the things they discovered and some of what they learned from their interviews, Chang. Uh, yes, definitely. So because LNG sector is um, kind of like emerging in Vietnam, so it is necessary for us to learn from other countries like Thailand or like Philippines who have like a long time running this market. And um, also because we like of like uh, policies for uh, environmental impact assessment. Um, so like evaluate the uh, negative impact or like the positive, even the positive impacts of uh, LNG projects on the ecosystem and also the community. Um, so I think like uh, from my interviews with experts, uh, we recommend uh, they recommend that it is necessary to uh, develop a specific uh, environmental impact assessment guideline framework for LNG power projects. In the past. So uh, actually, there's two there are two things that I learned from the interview. The first thing is is like it's questionable because when you have when they have like to do. The uh, mega project, like the big project, why they have to be like uh, like a transparency issue. Like for example, like when they want to conduct the uh, coal coal plant in the South Thailand, they say like they have only like five species in the mangrove, which is like it, it it doesn't work that way. Like uh, when when the local researcher go to that area and it's like they found like a lot of species in that area. So I think the issue is might be the. Uh, the transparency issues and another thing is like that I learned for the interview. Okay, I think we might have we have some network connection issues with the path, but I guess we can move forward with like our recommendations for our fellow journalists if they want to pursue their stories, like in like summarizing what you have learned for the past two months. How do you think other journalists can actually develop and follow up and LNG stories further? Yeah. Yeah. So 
maybe we can start um by reading um reports about not only energy but other um, energy sources such as this one published by C on energy um so i had a lot to do I had to do a lot of reading and research since I'm not really an energy reporter. So my work is really focused on the climate environmental impacts and then, of course, the people on the periphery and on communities. So aside from that, I think other journalists in the Philippines um, uh, can follow LNG stories since the Philippines is one of the countries uh, that is leading in Southeast Asia's plant gas expansion, as mentioned by Seed. And many of the projects are still in the development stage. And I think it's really important that um, journalists follow updates on these projects, even if these undertakings are still in pre-construction stage and report on the projected impacts or the compliance of the proponents with environmental rules and regulations. So um, there are a lot of stories about these projects um, that will affect many communities here in the Philippines, not only those that are near Metro Manila, um, and we have to tell those stories. Thanks, Gaya. Napat, um, hopefully you're back. Maybe you can share some best practices, tips, and tricks. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry for my internet connection. Uh, for me, like, uh, yeah, for sure, we are a developing country. So let's say that there's still a lot of work to do. And if we zoom out to a larger picture, there are still a lot of development projects waiting to be implemented. So if we still run on the same route, there would be a lot of issue, like social issue, environmental issue that we can cover. So. Let's zoom into my story. I don't know if it's uh, coincidental or not, but like, you know, like the Leo Thai government just announced that they will continue the uh, Jenna project, including LG Terminal last week. So I think it's important for the journalists to work with the uh, local and the scientists to show how important of this area. As I interviewed the, with the local researcher last month, they will kind of conduct a specimen in, in this area to collect sample and show to the government, like uh, what, they have in this area and why it's important. So I think if you have tools in your hand and you want to raise their voice up, it might be a chance to collaborate with them and publish this, this story. So yeah, that's it. Mm, uh, I think my uh, biggest limitation uh, in this fellowship is that I cannot do a case study because like uh, uh, we, we are going to have the first uh, like operational uh, LNG import uh, terminal in the fourth quarter of this year. So it's like uh, we, we don't have any case study right now. So like the in the future, the journalists can follow up with a case study to uh, to go more into the details about the impact of like H, uh, LNG uh, projects. Um, uh, on the uh, oh, we we kind of like lost uh Chang and, but um more I think uh I really wish our uh Indonesian fellow or data is here because she really has a good um reflection on um journalists uh trying to understand and digging deep, deeper on not just LNG but energy issues that are not really widely disseminated to the public. I mean, um, some of the LNG issues will definitely affect um, their day-to-day -day lives and basically their um, electricity costs. But you see, um, uh, some sometimes they're not mainstreamed in local media. And as Gaya said, it's really important for us to expand our knowledge. And I think basically, I believe that this partnership with an organization like SEED has really been helpful in for us journalists to kind of like really fully understand energy issues and deepen our reportage. So with that, I'd like to call on Avril again as we open the floor to some of the questions from our audience. Our fellows have shared some of their discoveries and how they um, and how they cover their articles. But um, Av, did, did you miss something? Are there things you wanted to highlight for um, other journalists to tackle? in their um, future articles. 
I mean, yeah, I think um, those those were pretty interesting stories already covered, and we've definitely seen those articles so far. Um, something that we probably would want to have more spotlight on would be um, financing, and then the connection of gas with the energy crisis that many of the, con the, the countries in our region are facing today. Um, you know, financial institutions play a critical role because these are capital intensive projects that cannot push through without funding, regardless of whether they've, sec they've secured the necessary permits or whether they've complied with the relevant national and local laws or regulation. And then um, of course the energy Crisis. We are facing record high gas prices. They impose grave burdens to the people um, while we have a pandemic lingering. Um, and in the Philippines, we already have two fossil fuel generation companies that are asking for price adjustments before the Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, and this is after a year of nonstop power rate hikes by the biggest distribution utility in the country. So this is something that we um, should expect would worsen if our country's increased reliance on imported fossil fuels, um, such as fossil gas and LNG. I think uh, we have a question here from Attorney Gia Ibai. Um, Attorney Ibai, maybe you'd like to ask the question yourself? Hi, everyone. Um... Yeah, thank thank you for 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 all the fellows and and I guess congratulations for getting your articles out. Yeah, I just wanted to cross check. I wanted to ask um if you were able to talk to any of those in the communities where these LNG plants will be located or are now being constructed, and how were you able to get them to speak? Oftentimes, when you talk to the communities, they have a bit sometimes misgivings or. Um, apprehension of speaking, um, but um, once they've done so, um, what what did you realize, or what did they even realize from having to express those thoughts? Yeah. Thanks, Attorney Gia. We actually had problems with um, uh, communities in Vietnam, but we were able to tap uh, coastal communities in the Philippines and Thailand. Gia, you maybe you want to start. Um, thank you for the question, Attorney Gia. Um, so, uh, for uh, for my my reporting on uh the LNG expansion, so I focused mainly focused on the um Verde Island Passage in Batangas, and then I also focused um uh, I also wrote a story about the planned um gas plant in San Carlos in Negros. Um, but. Um, I was lucky that I was able to really talk to the coastal folk in Batangas because I was there. I covered their protest um, on Earth Day and they were really protesting um, the planned gas expansion in the city. So um, I'm really thankful that um, through the help of SEED because um, they're in partnership um, um, with this uh, Treasure Folk group, I was able to talk to them. And when I, so it was easy because um, the fishers are organized. Um, um, they already know um, what are the projected impacts. And when I talked to them, I realized um, really how big this um, expansion would affect them. Since for them, where the island passage is their lifeblood, it's where they get the fish that they sell. It's where they get the fish that um, they eat, they serve with their families. So one of the fishermen that I was able to talk to said that life was good um, before um, Batangas became this hub of gas industries, kids, the universities. Um, but now he said that um, I think the um, fishers there are only able to catch um, two to three kilos um, whenever they venture out to fish. So you can see really um, 
the impacts of the existing plants. And they are really worried that once this proposed projects will be built, will be operational, um, there's this nice um, quote, and it's really heartbreaking quote from one of the future folk. He said that he is worried that his grandchildren may only know about the different types of fish in Verde Island um, passage through history books because he is um, really concerned that this um, gas expansion would affect, um, of course, it will affect because um, it will definitely affect morals, which are the habitats of fish. So he's really worried about um, his grandchildren not knowing about um, the fish in the area. Napat was able was also able to talk to fishermen in Chanan District. Maybe you can share. Yeah, sure. There were like two communities that I talked to. Like the first one would be in the east of Thailand, where the area has been already like destroyed. So they mentioned that like during the construction or when they have like incident, like last, maybe like last two or three months, they have the uh, oil spill like in that area. So like uh, it's completely like affect their livelihood. Like uh, the fish got contaminated and like the population got the, uh, the keep decreasing and decreasing and it's gonna take around like five or six years to be recovered. And the Another community that I talk would be like in Chana district. So it's like, uh, they said like in the past, in tourism, in three or four, I can't remember the exact number. Uh, they said like, there they was a project that construct the uh, trans, uh, the trans, trans joint, like that covered like the, the gas from the, uh, from the Gulf of Thailand. And they will send that gas, natural, Gas to Thailand and to the uh, Malaysia. So that during the construction, it's like totally affected livelihood, like by the the south of construction because, like, as I said, like they conduct to land, which like use their ear. So during the construction, they cannot hear anything, and the uh, fish stock like keep decreasing as well, as I mentioned. Thanks, Napat. Um, Atarinji, I hope we answered your question. We actually. I also wanted to highlight um, that in Indonesia, the role of energy campaigners has really been really useful for pushing forward the narrative of that fossil gas is dirty. Um, I, uh, in her Tatek's article, she um, highlighted the protest, like just what happened in the Philippines. Um, Gaya was raising her hand, go ahead. Yeah, um, I would also like to highlight since um, here in the Philippines, communities who are actually opposing projects, they are being labeled as anti-development. Um, but one of the fishermen that I was able to talk to said that they're not really anti-development and they're not fighting the government. So um, they just want um, the authorities, the proponents to understand um, their concerns and further study this, um, their projects and their impacts on um, the marine ecosystem and to, to, to their lives, the communities. So, and he really made a good point that um, once where the island passage is further damaged, it will not I mean, the ones who will be affected will not be only those living in Batangas, but also others and other other Filipinos and other provinces. So, really, um, the impact is really um, huge. Thanks, Gaya. We have another question from. I I don't really uh, know. Maybe you can uh, tell your name to us. Maybe. Neve, yes. Hi. Yes, hi. Hi, Neve. Sorry. Um, where are you from? Where? Uh, I'm I'm an investigative reporter from Israel Palestine. I'm uh, yeah. originally from Jerusalem. 
Uh, I've been dealing a lot with fossil fuels and I have the privilege to lead, a, be part of a group that is leading an international investigation. And I just, uh, regarding fossil fuels, and I just wanted to, I, I was just writing, it just takes me time to uh, give a few insights from our investigations regarding fossil fuels. So I'll try to be really, really quick and short. And then there's also my question, but I would just like to, to say that uh, environmental impact assessment we find is not enough, of course. You need to look at all aspects. Uh, a lot of times there's also a lot of interests in the environmental impact assessment. <clears throat> uh, hidden and external uh, economical costs are a key to a clear narrative. You have to remember that when you look into LNG, there's a whole life cycle of LNG. There's tankers, there's pipelines, there's terminals, there's pipelines and, and stations that are taking it out to the different regions and places. All of this has a huge environmental and also equivalent economical impact. That this is something that would help you create a more clear narrative that people would understand the costs of these projects. Um, evaluating the whole life cycle of LNG is very important. Uh, it's also... Neem, are you still with us? We kind of like lost you. Okay. Um, as we try to address some issues with Neem, um, maybe we can get this question from Respati. Respati, would you like to um, ask the question yourself? Governmental companies must be accountable for their actions. I, I will stop here and want continue, I will write my other insights, but I would like to ask, do you see any change in the discourse? Does it make really any impact right now? The coverage, the stories you're bringing, can you, can you see any difference? And do you have any hope that you can maybe stop some of it? I think I'll start with that because I kind of like led the project. We are really hopeful that um, we will have a some sort of a community impact because some of our story really, really focus on the communities affected by um, the LNG projects, especially since um, in Vietnam and the Philippines, they're um, just starting the projects and it's just in the pipeline. So we're trying to kind of like try to communicate what the resistance and the opposition from the communities that we covered. That's why we actually um, did the collaborative article on uh, the marine uh, biodiversity and its effects on marine biodiversity, mainly because we kind of like wanted to um, uh, uh, tell people a concrete um, impact of what will happen if LNG projects pushes through and it will not be just, you know, creation of jobs for those community, but these are the things that will be um, greatly impacted. Uh, maybe um, our fellows can... Um, actually also talk about um, what are their hopes and like the impacts of the story. Of course, um, I'd like to also preface my, my statement by saying we really can't uh, guarantee the impact in like the near future, but we are really hopeful na Pat. Sorry, uh, sorry, can you repeat the question again? Uh, like, what, what do you think would be the impact of our stories? Yeah, I think it's, it's just a part of the voice that, uh, that we brought from the local community who got impacted by the uh, project. So I think it's just a part of the, uh, of the story. So like, I think my point would be like, just keep, doing the work and like, as I said, like this project is still like continuing by the lawyer government. So like, it might be better to like, to cooperate with the local scientists and also with the local community and local residents to raise their voice up again and like to keep pushing this story. I think that's, that's it. Well, I think, uh... Uh, I, I also agree with Napad that it is not the problem of like one or two articles uh, to like have an 
big impact or like to change something. Uh, but like in Vietnam, I think um, uh, before we have any solutions, we As, as we try to get Trang again to reconnect, Gaya, any thoughts? Yeah, so I agree with Trang and Pat that, you know, one story about this is enough. So we really have to um, do more stories about um, the LNG projects here, um, not only here in the Philippines, but also in other countries, since most of the projects are still in the development stage, uh, pre-development stage. So we really have to scrutinize those projects, their impacts, um, as I've mentioned earlier, um, how they comply with their environmental rules and regulations. And also, I think, um, of course, we want our stories to have an impact because that's what we're, <laughs> that's one of our jobs as a journalist. But I think here in the Philippines, since um, uh, the shift to LNG has only begun recently because we're a big um, coal country. So I think it's nice that um, we're kind of introducing this topic, um, introducing um, how um, it will affect um, not only the energy security, if, if you know, in a negative or positive way, if there is any that or and then how it will impact communities, of course. So it's um, this work that we're starting right now. I hope that other um, journalists can also, you know, pick up so that um, we will be able to do a more comprehensive reporting on LNG projects and their impacts. Yeah, and to wrap that question up, I guess, um, that's why we're doing this community hangout to share what we have been what we had experienced over the past two months to be able to like you know encourage more journalists to write on this topic and for them to you know learn a thing or two from our discoveries and our you know missteps and also challenges that we had over um this fellowship um i guess uh, we have a time for like this last question from Ms. Patty. um in indonesia government communication about lng development to public seems to be utilized at this time Media hardly tries to criticize the government. Um, what about in the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam? I'll um, start with, I guess, um, as you know, we now have a new government in the Philippines and um, press freedom and media in our media landscape has really been um, depleting, I guess. So uh, maybe Gaya can um, build on that. You're muted, sorry. Yeah, so, you know, we just elected a dictator and it's not a really good, it's not a good thing for um, um, the press here in the Philippines. Um, it's going to worsen. Um, uh, we, we have seen it worsening under the Duterte and it, it is um, feared that it, it will actually get worse. So how much worse, we don't know. Um, so, um, but yeah, I think that even if we have this new um, president, this new government, I think that um, journalists really have to keep on, you know, doing their job, which is to inform, um, challenge the government narrative, um, you know, um, put pressure on airing officials, you know, airing companies. Um, yeah, I think um, we just have to keep do doing those things and in that way we're going to serve our um, audience. In the spirit of um, truthfulness and fact-checking, I'd just like to correct Gaya that we elected the son of a dictator just so no one will <laughs> come back to us and say uh, we most misspoke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, Napat, how about you? So, so I think like uh yeah it's quite 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 similar to your country like uh even though we got elected uh the the elected government like uh but it's from the military government so it's kind of like we have like limited press freedom so it's some sometimes it's pretty hard like to publish the article and like got the rest a good response from that 
like for example, if I publish this article in the last last year, like the comment might be full of like a uh, fake account like on Facebook, for example. So I think that, but however, like uh, I think keep working and like doing like a uh, to raise the voice of the uh, local residents and local plant scientists, like uh, whether which platform you are like uh, maybe it can be local media it can be international media just find the key find the angle and like try to push as much as you can I think like that's that's the key like for me personally just keep working on that and like keep inspired like other the new generation I put uh, especially put Chang in the last because I guess media landscape in Vietnam is different so maybe you can share a thing or two about it yeah, I'm sorry for uh, I, I lost the connection and finally we stopped somewhere and I have like more stable internet. Um, like the media landscape in Vietnam is maybe many of you know that uh, we are uh, owned by uh, we are influenced by the uh, government. So um, so like anything we put on the news, we have to go through like the like government's check. So. Um, um, so, so it's I, I, I think is will be um, uh, I, especially at this time after we have that COP twenty six commitment. So, uh, like the uh, uh, the articles will most articles will have to go with the um, like with the trend that the government is setting for the country. So, uh, but but it's not like we cannot raise like the. Um, like the opposite uh, or, or like the diverse uh, opinions. Uh, so, but um, I think for LNG uh, projects uh, in Vietnam, it's, um, it's, it's like, um, is the new thing. I asked uh, the citizens, villagers, and even researchers, they are very like reluctant to answer. So they will ask me first, what is that? And then, um, so like the uh, lack of awareness and lack of understanding is our first problem. And, and so that's why I think maybe researchers, uh, experts uh, should be the one who, uh, who care about it first, especially like for ones who are doing the uh, conservation, who are doing the environmental protection. Um, uh, well, well they, they will have to like draw the, uh, like, like the uh, one of our guests say that, uh, we have to 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 see the bigger picture, like the the, the total life cycle of LNG and as well as other uh, new energy in Vietnam. And it will be a long um, it will be a long term uh, because it's just one year, like nearly one year after we made that commitment. And, and and of course there will be a lot of changes in the policies in Vietnam. And so it it, it will also changes in the way that. The media in Vietnam will care about the um, uh, like the env environmental issues, especially energy related issues, because I'm seeing that uh, we have more uh, environmental journalists uh, and we have more environmental um, uh, articles in the news right now. Uh, before, uh, like few years ago, we may have like very few um, articles uh, like speaking about uh, marine pollution or. Um, I mean, very few articles, but we have more uh, people, more presses uh, raising voices uh, for this, um, um, for the oceans and like to, um, and, and, and also another point is, is that uh, uh, our government, especially uh, the prime minister who made the uh, COP26 uh, commitment, uh, he also asked the other, uh, like the Ministry of Trade to revise the, um, the, the national power plan in which LNG should be um, like adjusted. So that's why we still have to wait until uh, it is finalized. So uh, there's there are many things to discuss right now. And I, I, I will have to conclude this with just a saying from an expert that is actually for the uh, in Vietnam we are stepping like the energy path, the new energy path, like we are driving a car, but we don't know the destination. And we just like driving the car and then we're checking the map and then we're fixing our roadmap and then we're just going. So yeah, that's how we are right now.
Um, very well put, Trang. I think um, that's a very fitting end to our discussion. Um, and we, and with that, we actually have our work cut out for us because um, after this, we really have to like follow through and develop more stories on the energy transition in Southeast Asia. Um, and that's all we got for you today. Thank you for joining us.